I'll particularly focus a bit on automotive systems because that's what I have been pursuing a lot. But many of these lessons that I have seen, I have learned, probably apply to many other IoT devices. First, let's talk about automotive systems. We all know that cars can be hacked now. There have been lots of ways people have demonstrated. And it's not the matter that they can, can be hacked. The depressing fact is that it's very easy to do so. And it's getting easier as cars get more autonomous, which is the, really the issue of concern. However, none of this probably should come as a surprise. Long before cars were really electronics, uh, to the extent that they are today, uh, this is a quote that was attributed, that is attributed to Professor Christoph Parr. I'm not exactly sure if that attribution is correct or not, but this, this quote is well known. What he said is, at the time when cars were not that much composed of electronics, was that if cars were going to be electronics, then they would, they would go on a very different cadence, both in terms of development and in terms of security. He thought that, well, if cars really were electronics, they would be uh, going at 10 to the power 9 kilometers per hour at whatever 400 million horsepower, and it would be hacked four times a year. Well, there is hyperbole in it, of course, but that probably 10 to the power 9 kilometers per hour is not possible because of laws of physics. And if he were talking about this today, he might actually say four times a day instead of four times a year. But, that's the, but the overall point is that cars and electronics, and this is not just true of cars, but many other devices which are now getting connected to the internet, and in order to make them smart, they have been de originally developed with a very, very different objective under very different quality requirements, et cetera, than electronics. But now that they are becoming electronics, we have to worry about all the vulnerabilities and problems, not just hacks, but also purely electronic failures. But let's just focus on hacks and, see, and vulner security vulnerabilities here. Uh, like we, have, we know that these can, can be hacked, so of course, now cars can be hacked. Of course, you might come back to me and say, well, cars had electronics since the 1970s. Probably some of the, one of the earliest electronic advancement in a car was in the 1970s with the fuel injection. However, the point is not just the electronics, but the connectivity. Now, a car can talk to a lot of different networks, different levels of reliability. As they become more and more autonomous, they would become, they would be talking to other cars, to the infrastructure, etc. And there is something that we often cheekily call Beckstrom's law of cybersecurity, which essentially says two things. Anything connected to the internet can be hacked, and now everything is connected to the internet. So your logic 101 should tell you that everything can be hacked. So of course cars can be hacked. The real problem here is, which makes it, car, which makes it true for cars and often many other IoT devices, is that these were not systems designed for connectivity in the first place. Your light bulbs and refrigerators were not meant to be connected to the internet when they were first designed or architected. These were, whenever electronics was put in, those electronics were initially for internal communications only. For, for example, in a car, there, there is this scan network through which uh, various electronic control units commun communicate each, with each other. It was not meant for somebody outside to get access to the can when it was developed. So now you take all this, the whole network or the whole system was initially architected to be inherently trusted. There was code written which was old, which was proprietary and which was probably didn't go through a lot of scrutiny. And now you take that and open it up to internet. What do you expect? Now, I say these things, and usually I come, uh, there is a whole bunch of people in the audience who say, OK, so why do we want all these autonomy? Let's not have those. We are happy with our own cars today. We are driving them. So why bother? The reason is that we are not doing very well. This room might be an exception. Maybe you guys are perfect drivers. But generally speaking, humans are very lousy drivers. They, get, they sleep, they get drunk, they are distracted. So still, today, with all these problems of electronics, 94% of accidents are still due to humans. So if you say that we, we are happy with the status quo, then we are, you are happy with the status quo which involves 1.3 million road accidents a year with trillions of dollars in cost. So clearly, we, we want to do better. And the question is, how can we do better if uh, uh, while still taking into account these problems of security. And we don't have an answer. That's why we are in this panel. 
But I want to sort of point out that there are certain unique constraints, and some of these the other panelists pointed out, but I want to say a couple of things about it, and then I'm going to stop. Um, there are unique constraints in, in developing, architecting devices that are for this purpose. One of them is that they would have a long, complex field life, very different from your, even your mobile phone or your computers. A car will remain in, in field for 15, 20 years. That has different, uh, different repercussions in security, in that overall requirement in connectivity, et cetera. And you're, you have to architect them in that way. Uh, there was mention of quantum computing. Should we do, make all the crypto and authentication post quantum resistant? Probably not, because then it would be so expensive that you are going to not be able to sell that car today. Maybe it's resistance 15 years later, but what happens to the company today? But you'd have to do it in a way that you can replace without any problem the authentication that was not quantum resistant, if the quantum resistance come in, and how can you architect these things in such a way? The second problem is that these have to be mass produced. I was in companies where we were talking about a very different set of applications, but considering that there would be billions of them, there is no way you would have different configurations for every different device. It's impossible. They also want to don't, don't want to do it because a configuration that is not validated is not considered good, good for production. Therefore, they are not going to put that there. So because you can, can, can only validate a few, you, would, you are going to only have a few configurations, which means they would be mass produced with same configurations no matter what. And you'd have to worry about it. You'd have to worry about machine-to-machine -machine collaboration. You'd have to worry about real-time communication. And uh, you'd have to worry about security in that context. You'd have to worry about what will happen if, say, um, the thing is driving at 70 miles an hour and there is a suspicious communication. Do you stop it just like you stop a web browser from going there? Then the car will just create an accident right there. So the, the whole system, the whole application domain has changed. And I would stop with, with this picture. In order to address this, we should not consider security as, a, as that thing we would we'd solve. We have to think about the, the security in the context of many other things that involve security, that all has dependency on security, like connectivity, energy efficiency, um, uh, intelligence. And we would have to consider them together. If you consider security alone, you'd come up with solutions that are not very useful. And in order to do this, you'd have to have extend traditional pillars in some way, traditional foundational pillars in some way so that they can comprehend trade-offs between them, and we would have to drive them to applications. With that, I'm going to stop and 